welcome. In this video, I'll be recreating this 1840s evening gown inspired by the one worn by Jenna Coleman as Queen Victoria in the Masterpiece Theater series, Victoria. I really, really love this series. It's the costumes in it are just fantastic. And I knew ever since I first watched the show many years ago that I wanted to recreate costumes from the show. The show chronicalizes Victoria's life from when she's coronated. And then so far we are in season three and she has, I believe, all of her children by this point. So we are in the 1850s going into the 1860s. The costumes for at least this first season of Victoria were designed by Rosalind Ebbett and they're just really, really good. Beautiful 1840s gorgeousness. This particular dress that I'm recreating is the dress that Victoria wears when she meets Albert for the second time. She meets Albert for the first time when Albert comes to her 17th birthday party and when that is in 1837. She is not yet queen. Then her uncle dies and she becomes queen. And then Albert comes again, this time in 1839. And this dress that I'm recreating is the one she wears when they meet again. In the season one, episode two, I believe, entitled The Clockwork Prince. I really love the this 18, 1839 dress, it has the typical silhouette and look of evening dresses from the late 1830s, early 1840s. It has, it's very off the shoulder, it has a gathered bertha, and it has these really beautiful puff sleeves, which really drew me to this dress, because I was originally going to recreate another teal evening gown she wears in the series, which she also wears in the title sequence of the series. But then I was re-watching the series for more inspiration and I stumbled upon this dress. I was like, that's the dress I'm gonna make. So I hope you enjoyed this recreation. And I also plan to make a full set of the her Order of the Garter Regalia, which will be featured in a separate video. Here's a little sneak peek. I hope you enjoy. To make this dress, I used Prior Tires, the Victorian dressmaker, for the basic bodice, and Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion 1 for the sleeves. Here is a before and after of my pieces, the left being the original and the right being what I ended up with after my mock-up. I draped the Bertha myself and it consists of two pieces, an inner structural layer and a larger layer which will get gathered down. The sleeves are referred to as Marie sleeves in Arnold's book and are large crescent shapes that are gathered down at the middle to create two puffs. The fabric I chose for the evening dress is this two-toned red and teal taffeta from the IAEA Fabric Mart. First thing I cut out was the skirt, for which I tore three panels, one for the front and two for the back, the length of my waist to above my feet, and the width of the fabric. I then cut a hem facing 10 inch wide, a popular width of the period, plus seam allowance for the entire 166 inch hem.
I also cut the same length and width out of tarlatan, which is a period stiffening fabric. Now that the skirt was cut out, I cut out all the bodice pieces. I also cut out the bodice from a layer of white cotton twill for strength. I then cut out the sleeves which took a yard of fabric each. This whole dress took 7 yards of my fashion fabric. I also cut the sleeves out of tarlatan for stiffening and muslin for lining. The final piece to be cut out was the outer and inner bertha and the pocket. The first step in making the skirt was to pin the pocket pieces to one side of the front and one side of the back panel. The pocket was sewn with a half inch seam allowance. I then sewed the rest of the seam, sewing the bags of the pocket together. After that was sewn, I sewed the other side of the front panel to the back as a regular seam. Here you see me pinning the placket, which is a rectangular piece of fabric backed with muslin, to the top of the center back seam. I then ironed the bottom of the placket up and inwards and folded the placket in half so that the selvage edge of the center back seam covered it. I then hand sewed the placket in place. Now moving on to the hem facings. I marked half an inch away from the edge of the facing and pushed the tarlatan into that fold and pinned it in place. I sewed the tarlatan in place by machine.
I pad stitch the places where the tarlatan hats overlap. I then sew the three hem facings together into a giant tube. I then pinned the edge of the facing that was not where the tarlatan was attached to the bottom of the skirt right sides together and sewed it by machine using a half inch seam allowance. After it was sewn, I ironed the hem facing inward and pinned. I then sewed it by hand using whip stitches. Here's how it looked when finished. I'm really proud of it. The hem was invisible from the outside. Now it is time to cartridge plate the back two panels. I marked three lines parallel to the top of the skirt. One a quarter of an inch away from the top, one half inch away, and one three quarters of an inch away. I then used this little seam allowance guide and marked lines perpendicular to the top of the skirt a quarter of an inch away from each other. The reason for all this precision is that cartridge pleats require multiple rows of similar stitching. All these chalk lines are guides for that stitching, which you see me doing here using purple upholstery thread. You want to use strong thread because it stays in the garment and gets a lot of strain.
Here is the finished panel with ruler for scale. A 54 inch wide panel down to about 3 inches. I then sewed the waistband a 3 inch wide strip of fabric on until I got to the side seams. I then matched the center front of the waistband to the center front of the skirt. I then folded both pieces in half, in and half again, until I had 8 equal sections. I then matched the pins on the skirt with those on the waistband and formed a knife pleat. I pleated the front panel away from the center front. I then sew the rest of the waistband by machine, then iron the edge of the waistband, not attached to the skirt, inward. This was then sewn by hand using whip stitches. I then sew two hooks to the waistband using black upholstery thread. I then sewed two eyes to the waistband in a similar manner. Here's how the closures looked once finished, and with them done, the skirt is done, and it's time to move on to the sleeves. These sleeves are the most complicated I've ever made, and took me a day per sleeve to construct. Here you see me marking the center gathering line on the sleeves using friction pens.
I then ran two rows of gathering inside these lines. I did this from the inside of the sleeve so the markings could be seen easier. I then pulled on those gathering threads to a length I determined in my mock-up, which was for me 14 inches. I then pinned and sewed by hand, using prick stitches, a band of bias tape over the gathering threads to hide them and to further secure them. I then gathered the bottom of the sleeves to 12 inches and pinned on another band of 2 inch wide bias tape. This was sewn on by machine and finished by hand and served as the hem of the sleeves. I then turned my attention to the upper sleeves. Sleeves during this period poofed starting at the bicep. The bottom of the upper sleeve got a band of piping. It was sewn by machine using a zipper foot. I then gathered the top of the lower sleeve to fit the bottom of the upper sleeve and sewed it by machine. I then pinked the edge to finish. The underarm seam was then sewed by machine. It was finished by hand using bias binding. I then also bound the seam of the upper and lower sleeve because I discovered that when I tried the sleeve on, the exposed tarlatan in the seam allowance scratched me. Here are all my bodice pieces. Ignore the upper sleeve. You've already seen what happens to that piece. The first step was ironing all my pieces. The final prep step before assembly was to base the fashion layer with the strength layer, which is a process called flatlining. From here on out, they are treated as one piece. Now the 1830s and the beginning years of the 1840s loved to pipe everything. To make piping, I cut 2 inch wide strips of bias tape and sandwiched 3 mm macrame cord in between. I 
then pinned it to both sides of the side piece, so when the side front and side back seams were sewn, they would be piped. After the piping was sewn, I pinned and sewed the two darts on the front piece. After the darts were sewn, the front was pinned to the side piece and the side to the back. They were all sewn by machine using half inch seam allowance. After the bodice was assembled, minus the shoulder seam, I attached piping to the bottom of the bodice. After the piping was sewn, I ironed it inwards, thus finishing the bottom of the bodice. The excess bias tape was turned inwards and finished by hand using whip stitches. I then pinned together and sewed the shoulder seams. Now it was time to set the sleeves. I mashed underarm seams and shoulder points, then ease the rest to fit. Here is the sleeves being sewn in by machine. After they were sewn, the seam was pink to finish. Now that the main bodice was done, it was time to move on to the outer bertha. The center front, shoulder points, and center backs were marked with chalk and measured a quarter of an inch away from the edges, ascending that vertical chalk mark. I then gathered all these points by hand. The inner bertha got piping along the top and bottom. I then pinned and sewed the outer bertha onto the inner bertha, right sides together. The bertha was then turned inside out and ironed flat. Back 
to the bodice proper, the top of which was ironed inwards by half an inch. I then sewed a piece of chewel tape over that raw edge to stabilize it. I then pinned the bertha on top of the bodice, matching the bottom of the top piping with the top of the bodice. I then sewed this by hand using whip stitches. The neckline was not yet done because I had to add some lace detailing. I whipped the bottom of the lace to the top of the bodice. Now the only thing left was boning enclosures. For boning channels, I sewed together strips of cotton twill. I then cut them to length. The center back, side back, side seam, and darts were all boned. For every seam but the side back, I used 7mm synthetic whalebone. I used spiral steel for the side back seam, just because of the curve of that seam. I then pinned the bones in place. After they were pinned, I sewed them down by hand, turning the bottom and tops of the casings inwards to encase the bone and prevent it from poking through. Here is how the bodice looked once boned. I then folded under the back of the bodice and pinned it down. It was hand sewn in place using whip stitches. I then sewed some hook and eye tape, which will not be linked below because I hate it, to the left side of the bodice, about a quarter of an inch from the center back edge. For the right side of the bodice, I went with thread bars which you make by taking a loose back stitch, then doing a blanket stitch over that thread loop to strengthen it. This is a period appropriate technique and save my sanity because I wanted to throw the eye part of the hook and eye tape into Tartarus. I hope you enjoy the reveal. Jewelry like always will be linked below. If you've seen the show, I hope you appreciate my choice of music.